and the the tax base when you're talking about international financial taxation transactions is huge so many of these transactions occur every day so it's a huge tax base so the concept is that a tiny tax rate on this huge tax base would be capable of generating lots of income and the income would go really to a supranational body because it's difficult to know where at the national level the you know you'd, you'd be imposing this tax so it has become popular in over recent years to think about this as using the income from that sort of tax to fund international development. Um, it's, a, it's, it's also part of the zeitgeist at the moment though because we know that the, the role of the international financial system has, you know, has, played a ma has been of major importance in generating the current financial crisis. So, so there's a strong sense that the international financial system should be taxed more heavily than it has been up till now to sort of recoup some of the responsibility that it has played. But there's, there's a couple of, uh, and as you may know, uh, Jose Manuel Barroso, the, the president of the European Commission, announced just in September that the Commission was going to come up with proposals to introduce a, a tax of this type across the EU. So that's, so hence, you know, there's a lot of discussion of it at, uh, at this stage. There's just a couple, though, of issues that have proved well, controversial, many issues, I suppose, in fact, that when Tobin initially proposed it, there was the sense that these huge flows of funds internationally were largely speculative and that they were encouraging volatility in the international financial market, the kind of volatility that we see every day, you know, now with respect to Greece, Italy, Ireland, Portugal, and so on, and that therefore taxing these speculative flows would be efficient, so it would serve a social good. Um, since then, though, there's been you know a lot of research that indicates that um, most inter the vast bulk of international financial transactions are not actually speculative, but that they're undertaken to hedge risks and to ensure liquidity. So that basis for the Tobin tax has been under attack. There's a sense that it's it's not all then about simply discouraging speculation. Also then there's issues, and I imagine Michal might be talking about a number of these aspects of it. There's a notion that if you put a tax on transactions, that will affect companies' behaviour. So they will, rather than, than engaging in say a thousand transactions a day, they might engage in only one transaction a day to minimise the impact of the tax. But if you think about that, that can increase volatility rather than reduce it, because rather than having loads and loads of transactions going on every day in a market, which would tend to stabilise prices, if you, know, you have a small number of transactions coming in with major amounts of money, which is what companies would be doing to, to, to try and avoid the liability of the tax, then a huge transaction taking place on an essentially, you know, on what would otherwise be a stable market can lead to increased volatility. So there's not unanimous agreement that the Tobin tax would reduce volatility. It may have the opposite effect. And to think of it then as a revenue source rather than, you know, as a corrective tax, a tax of uh, to design to reduce volat volatility, think about it as a revenue source. Again, you can realize very rapidly that international finance as a tax base, as something you can levy tax on, tends to be very mobile or very elastic. So there's a possibility that if Europe introduced this tax, then the tax base or these financial transactions will simply take place outside Europe. So there's a strong sense that a Tobin tax to work would need to be imposed at the global level, or at least, you know, a single country could not really do it because its tax base would disappear. Everybody would shift offshore to, you know, to, let's say, the Cayman Islands and do their financial transactions there. So part of the notion of actually ensuring that the tax base doesn't disappear completely, you know, there's a strong sense that it has to be imposed at a global level, or at the minimum, that you need to clamp down on the international financial tax havens, the place, a lot of which are located in the Caribbean and so on. So this is you know, places like Bermuda and the Cayman Islands and so on. So part and parcel of 
a Tobin tax, if it's to work, requires a clampdown on the ability of finance to move to tax haven countries and hence avoid the burden of the tax. So I think that relates to what Sorley is going to going to be talking about. So this is by way of an overview that kind of tries to capture, you know, hopefully at a fairly basic level, some of the issues um, that are involved. So we have two two guest speakers here. First is Michal uh, Collins, who was um, formerly a colleague of ours at Trinity and has just recently left to join the newly established Economic Research Institute. Um, his main area is taxation. Um, gets lots of media appearance over the recent years every time, you know, new tax proposals were being discussed in advance of a budget and so on. Um, and he's recently been appointed a member of the Government Advisory Group on Tax and Social Welfare. And our second speaker is uh, Sorley McCoy, who, um, who's a policy and advocacy officer at Christian Aid Ireland and does a lot of work on economic justice into which this, you know, tax... Uh, uh, these tax issues fall, and then climate change. And both of our speakers have um, reasonably extensive experience in the, in the developing world. Um, so there'll be a developing economy focus to this discussion. So I'm going to ask Michal to come up and speak for us. Uh, okay, <clears throat> uh, thank you, Frank. Um, I'm battling a slightly sore throat, so worst case scenario, I may come to a halt halfway through. <clears throat> Hopefully not, but um, but I may uh, stop for a sip of a, a hot drink uh, along the way. Um, and uh, can I, at the outset, thank uh, Sarah and her colleagues for the the invitation to to come and uh, speak. It, it's great to see the Trinity Development Research Week grow from strength to strength uh, as, it, uh, as it is. Um, there's really four parts, I suppose, to what I wanted to uh, overview and, and talk about uh, today. Um, uh, a quick sort of few obvious points, maybe at the start on taxation and development, because it's uh, that angle that I'm, I'm going to take here, talking about uh, Tobin taxes and indigenous or national taxation systems. Um, talk about uh, reflecting some of what Frank has, has just said and, and developing a little bit uh, some of uh, issues around international sources for financing uh, development. Um, and I thought I'd throw all the names in there that appear uh, here and there on uh, what are much the same as you'll see uh, the Tobin tax, the Robin Hood tax, the FTT, and the FAT. Um, a little uh, brief overview of the indigenous role or the uh, developing world country role that's to be played here, and, and then some very brief conclusions uh, at the at the tail end. Um, uh, start with the uh, context for all of this. Um, in a sense, stating the obvious point, but it's worth making the obvious point at the outset because it allows the others to follow. Um, uh, and that is that you know clearly financing development is expensive, um, and it's also long term. Um, a bit like the revenue from the Tobin tax that you'll see in a while, there's no great agreement as to precisely how much that might cost because it very much depends what stage of development we want to get to or where we see the world going and so on. Um, the World Bank certainly uh, indicate that we should be spending or we would be spending an extra $40 billion per annum uh, to reach the Millennium Development Goal targets. We're not going to get to the 2015 targets, but we'll revise those and the signals are there for that so that if we maybe move those uh, a little bit out further, we're, we're still at that scale of revenue. Um, and when you think about the, the revenue that's involved there, there's both capital and current costs. There's capital or in investment costs into, wa into water or environmental um, investments. Uh, but there's also quite significant recurring current costs that come with achieving development. Um, was thinking about uh, the antiretroviral drugs that go with uh, tackling HIV AIDS. Um, that's a huge cost. Um, and if we're to make progress, and we seem to be on tackling HIV AIDS, it will be through greater distribution of antiretroviral drugs, uh, which in a sense isn't solving the problem, but it's solving the, um, or it's addressing at least the, the, the experience that people have 
uh, of HIV AIDS and, and sort of slowing down the, the consequences uh, of it. Um, if you're not really solving the problem and you're just distributing the drugs, well then that bill gets bigger and bigger and bigger uh, over time and that's a, a really difficult thing uh, for countries and for the international system to manage as well. I suppose it speeds us up towards the need in that case for a, a HIV AIDS vaccine. Um, but of course it would also in a current sense apply to teachers if we're going to achieve the Millennium Development Goals on education and the level of education participation, well that requires more teachers and more teacher salaries and that's a lo an ongoing current cost uh, as well. So overall expensive and overall long term uh, it's, a, it's an expensive uh, approach. The uh, 2008 uh, conference in Doha and the declaration that came from that which really reflected the earlier uh, Monterey consensus from uh, 2002, uh, that signaled the need for both international and indigenous sources for uh, financing development. Um, and that's really how I'm structuring this, that we need to think about both uh, of those sources and the development of two uh, sustainable sets of uh, revenue sources for, for development uh, coming from those. And I'm taking that, or my perspective on that, or on those, uh, is very much a taxation perspective. Um, start with the international uh, sources then. Um, and my, my principal focus here is going to be on the, the Tobin tax, as sort of highlighted in the program, um, uh, because it's really had some, some long attention, as, as Frank said, uh, originating in 1972. I think uh, Tobin initially proposed a, a CTT, he called it a currency transaction tax, and it was all about currency movements and currency volatility, because that's very much what uh, was, I suppose, the order of the day and the principal forms of financial activity that was going on at the time. Uh, and as Frank said, it was just the idea of a small tax on global capital flows, big base, small tax, and that would capture uh, a large amount of revenue. Um, as we sort of, after, if you were to, to, to draw a, a graph for the popularity of the Tobin tax, it sort of went up and down and, and up and down along the way. It's come back into fashion over the, the last number of years uh, for numerous reasons, which I'll get to. Um, but other terms have appeared recently along the same lines, the Robin Hood tax in the UK, uh, which is really a variant or much the same as the, the Tobin tax proposal. Um, the financial transactions tax, FTT, um, at a European level, which I'll come back to, which is, again, much the same as a, a, a Tobin tax. Um, uh, and I'll separate that out from the FAT tax, FAT, the financial uh, activities tax. There is a discussion on fat taxes for saturated foods and all that as well, but this is, this is the, the other fat tax, um, which uh, is uh, really simply a levy on the uh, remuneration and profits, uh, and in some cases the liabilities of banks, and that's being proposed uh, very much sort of as a, a legacy from the, the banking crisis that we've had uh, over uh, the last uh, period. Um, there's some sort of discussion uh, ongoing currently between the EU and the IMF and others as to whether the route to follow here is to go down that very broad financial transactions tax across many financial transactions or more narrowly to focus it on the banking sector which gives you a, the uh, and on the, the profits, remuneration and liabilities of the banking sector which is the financial activities tax. Um, the percentage tax would have to be quite high on those sectors to generate serious amounts of, uh, of uh, revenue. Uh, but interestingly, I was at the uh, talking about taxation at the Ken Mary Economics Conference a few weeks ago, and uh, A.J. Chopra, uh, who was speaking there, uh, uh, spoke very much strongly in favour of that uh, financial uh, activities tax. It's something the, the IMF uh, like. Well, that's a good thing or a bad thing, uh, or the kiss of death is the IMF like, and I'm not, not sure, but, but they, they talk about it anyway. Um, I suppose over, <clears throat> over time, all of those um, uh, tax ideas uh, have been sort of ruled out, but you'd have to say, and certainly I'd be of the view, uh, that for a number of reasons, there's a growing consensus now that we're moving towards some, or, or rather one, uh, of those uh, as uh, as the route, and I would have thought that's going to bring us in the, in the direction, probably of some form of of uh, Tobin tax. Let me just flesh out the the Tobin tax proposal uh, a little bit uh, then, as to firstly how it might work. Um, Frank mentioned this too. Uh, the uh, EU Commission President Barroso uh, announced in September 
uh, that the EU would from 2014 introduce a financial transactions tax. Uh, they're having rows about that since. I think the current one is ongoing today with the, very, with the meeting of the various finance ministers. Um, but the proposal there was for a tax of 0.1%, so uh, one-tenth of 1% 1 on the trading of bonds and shares, and one-hundredth of 1%, 0 0.01, on uh, derivative products. Um, I noticed it didn't explicitly include currency, actually, and currency transactions, mainly because I suppose that's become such a small factor of the, uh, the system, although it is sort of tied up very much in some of the derivative products as well. Um, that proposal, or whatever version of it, likely to exclude uh, internal bank transfers or trades, uh, companies moving money uh, internally, or banks moving money internally, uh, rather, we're talking about it applying probably to uh, open market activities and movements. Uh, the reason I make that point is that if you were to sort of get a figure in there around for how much money moves around in various ways all the time, it's much bigger than what really moves around because some of it is, is just internal transfers rather than actually uh, open uh, market activities. And it would be on those open market activities and movements that we'd be looking at the tax falling. Um, the EU proposal is currently just an EU proposal for implementing from 2014 within the European Union. They're referring to it as FTT, Financial Transactions Tax. Um, but interestingly, since that came along, um, and it's been sort of simmering away for quite a while, uh, up until it came along, uh, there have been some positive movements elsewhere. It's certainly been talked about as a realistic proposal in the uh, United States context as well. Um, and as it moves in towards presidential elections, that concept of, of uh, raising revenue from this sector uh, has, has moved to become more attractive. Uh, that might also reflect the, the fiscal position of the United States where it needs to raise more revenue somewhere. And if you could raise it from taxes that don't fall on ordinary people or indeed ordinary companies, that might be far more attractive and that might push the political system in that way as well. Nonetheless, um, there's certainly been bills towards Congress and discussions uh, recently in the United States uh, on that, uh, something that previously had been totally ruled out, but that is being more realistically considered now uh, as a proposal. Um, how much would some Tobin tax or financial transactions tax raise? Well, I really wanted to come here. Um, I had coffee with, with Sorley a couple of weeks ago. I said, I must try and sit down and see, can I put a number together? And the more I tried to do that, the more frightened I got of what the number would be because they vary or the, the tax base or the definition of the tax base uh, is unclear uh, and varies very broadly. Uh, depends on what uh, and where you include and where in terms of the world and, and what you include in terms of the uh, activities. Uh, the European Commission have come up uh, in, in their proposal with a figure suggesting it will bring in about 50 billion euro uh, per annum uh, in, in taxes. I thought that was quite optimistic. Um, uh, I think the figure is much lower. It's probably the order of 15 to uh, 25 billion euro. I'm conscious a billion euro has become a small amount of money over time, but it's still a reasonably decent chunk of, of cash to be talking about on a per annum basis that we might uh, be able to see coming from uh, a financial uh, transactions uh, tax. But And, and indeed, you'll see some suggestions that would, would say the revenue will be 10 times uh, that level uh, as well. Um, why, <clears throat> why would you do a, uh, a financial transactions tax? Well, let me kick off with the reason that I think is the strongest reason for doing it, which is nothing at all to do with development. And uh, in fact, this is really my view on why the time has come for some type of financial transactions tax. Um, and that is that it would allow governments to more closely monitor the activities of financial institutions, um, financial institutions broadly defined, financial markets you might almost call it. Um, as we've seen, governments end up having to pick up the pieces when those financial institutions go wrong. We're very much the um, poster boy uh, for that in terms of how bad it can go, but it, but it applies uh, uh, with even bigger amounts of money because the economies are bigger across the world. Um, we've also seen at the start of this uh, economic recession that governments and their agencies like central banks and so on um, had limited insight into the nature and the scale of financial transactions that were going on uh, in their countries and between their countries. 
um, you know, when the, the US subprime issue uh, emerged firstly and then the recession uh, that followed. It was very clear that governments, central banks, didn't know uh, precisely the, the, the levels of financial transactions that were going on. Um, and really, therefore, from a, a societal perspective, it would be worth implementing a financial transaction tax that provided as a byproduct immediate information on the financial movements and liabilities of, of companies. For governments to have that, for central banks to have that, uh, and for governments to know all the time what was going on and what, in a sense, liabilities they're covering or carrying, or how big or small they were becoming, uh, would be very beneficial to society uh, for that to happen. Uh, I'd honestly be of the view, even if it raised no money at all, if that's all it did, uh, that would be worth doing. Um, because it would, uh, in some way, protect uh, countries from the uh, impact of the crisis over the last uh, couple of uh, years. So to me, <clears throat> to me, that's the main reason for, uh, at least currently, uh, for uh, introducing some form of a financial transactions uh, tax. Um, in fairness, it's likely to raise revenue, and we should maybe think about what we could possibly do um, uh, with that revenue. It will provide revenue to do something useful. Um, it's noticeable that there's many and increasing numbers of groups who claim the revenue from some form of a financial transactions tax. Uh, it was very much the development, well, when, when Tobin came along and um, proposed it in the first place, he, if, if I remember right, he wasn't necessarily pointing towards it going anywhere, perhaps to, to exchequers. Um, the development community, community did latch onto it early on, uh, and it's been there for a long time, but they've been joined by others who've been pointing towards it as uh, a source uh, over time. Um, those groups, governments themselves, I mean, certainly the European Union in its proposal isn't proposing that they do this to provide funds for development. It is very much to provide funds for the European budget. Um, um, uh, and governments in different countries, I assume that's probably the route the United States might be going here as well, uh, using it to address budget deficits and to uh, address the, the legacy banking costs that they've taken on. Um, the development community, as I said, using uh, proposing it to finance development. The environmental community, they're, they're somehow complementary, but nonetheless just maybe distinguish between them, uh, pointing towards it to uh, address climate uh, change uh, over the last couple of years uh, as well. Uh, and I thought I'd throw the other one in on national policy goals, which I don't think have quite appeared yet, but let's see as time goes on if suddenly we, uh, governments and at a European level or the United States or others, start pointing towards a large pool of money, it's only a matter of time before uh, internal uh, fingers start pointing towards national things that could be done uh, with, the, with the funds as well. We should note uh, here as well that, uh, and Frank touched on this actually, that the, the revenue from a financial tra transactions tax of whatever type is likely to be volatile. Uh, it's not likely to be a stable source. And, and again, we're almost the poster boy uh, as a country for how not to do things on the back of volatile um, tax revenue flows. Uh, so, uh, you know, it will move with the economy, it will move with, with uh, uh, levels of economic growth, it, it, will, it will plunge in recessions and so on. So it'll be quite volatile uh, and it's possible, um, or it's important that we take that into account when we're thinking about the fact that this isn't providing a flat, stable revenue source. It would be providing a revenue source, but there'd be a certain volatility uh, that, uh, that will go in there as well. Uh, the third reason to do it is probably to dampen some short-term speculation uh, and volatility, um, which of course was Tobin's original uh, objective. And precisely how much of that it would do uh, is interesting. It would, it would at least, if we talk about a very large amount of financial transactions that are going on out there, a certain proportion of them are speculative. As, um, but not all of them, are, are not, not anywhere near all of them. It would be a very small percentage, but they are. Uh, and it would be dampening down some of those, or it at least puts another factor in there that there's a further cost associated with these, uh, which might in some way uh, uh, dampen that down. Uh, I don't think that's anywhere near as strong as the other two reasons uh, for doing it, but, but just to mention. 
Um, let me mention the impediments to doing it as well, which is, is the other side. Um, the first are technical challenges. You, you couldn't do this. How would you gather all the information? And for a long time, really, that's why the Tobin tax uh, or variance of it was going nowhere, in, in that really we just weren't able to be able to track uh, that information. But, but things have changed so fundamentally now uh, uh, that we are. There are some few uh, technical challenges. Uh, but I noted a document from the IMF recently which said, uh, and it wouldn't necessarily be in favour of financial transactions tax, but it said there weren't, in any real sense, technical impediments to the introduction uh, of, <coughs> excuse me, some form of taxation like that. Um, the second impediment to, to following a, a route like this might be whether we think about it as a sort of universal world system or whether we see it as an EU solo run which is where the Commission are coming from currently. Um, the ideal uh, scenario would be the, the whole world would simultaneously adopt a financial transaction tax or a Tobin tax, and indeed that's what Tobin pointed to uh, in '72 when he, he made these proposals in the first place. Uh, that's not realistic for, for various reasons. There are a num number of countries uh, that are just not likely to, to go there. The tax havens that Frank mentioned earlier, even some of the big players on financial... Um, uh, transactions like Singapore, I, I wonder would they go there, I, I doubt it, uh, if, if it was being adopted uh, elsewhere. Um, certainly the EU could go down the route of doing this uh, alone, which is its current proposal, and its uh, current proposal is for doing it just on internal EU transactions. Um, there's a danger that that could have quite high distortionary effects. All taxes have distortionary effects that change the behaviour of those who are levied, uh, who, who, who levy those taxes upon them. Um, if the EU did it by itself, that's an, uh, an issue uh, that would may, may very well be problematic. Um, if the EU and the US did it together, I would have thought that's far more feasible if you sort of bring together the, the two major blocks. And, and uh, I, I wasn't going to list out everybody else as well, but I'm assuming if you did that, that most of the other developed parts of the world would sort of uh, fall into to line and participate as well. A strong support for this in Canada, I know, anyway, for example, just to, just to think about it. Um, Were the uh, financial transaction tax to be universal, were it to be applied all over the world, it won't be, but were it to be, uh, well, in a sense, the consumer would end up absorbing the tax. It would just really be an increase in the cost of operating. Um, were the financial transactions tax not to be universal, maybe to be just within the EU and the US and elsewhere, which is perhaps more likely, um, then for companies to be able to continue to com for financial companies to be able to continue to compete on world markets uh, in providing the services that they provide various trades and hedges and so on uh, they would really have to absorb the cost of that tax uh, into their profit margins um, therefore they'll campaign very strongly against it uh, because they don't want to absorb the tax into their profit margins um, but uh, they'd be more more and that's likely where it would go now, it brings you back to issues about how big are the profit margins for trades that financial institutions make. Um, but I would have thought they would be able to accommodate, uh, in the case of derivatives, a one one hundredth of a percent, or in the case of uh, the other shares in bonds, uh, one tenth of one percent of, of a tax. I, I doubt that would actually wipe out their, their profits. It would reduce their profits. Uh, but I wouldn't think it's likely uh, to, to wipe them out. Um, and the third <coughs> impediment to, uh, to mention is uh, issues around displacement and loss of uh, financial activity as well. Um, and, and that's an impediment in that we might think about it and, and you know, if this is going to happen, do we really want to do this? Uh, will be how governments will want to think about it. Um, Without doubt, there'll be some displacement, certainly, if the entire world doesn't simultaneously adopt a financial transactions tax. Um, and some activity will move, but a lot won't, because the rates are small and the trades are, uh, in some or many cases, uh, unavoidable. Um, I suppose if it was too much of a concern, um, you, you could structure a financial transaction tax to tie it in some way to the origin of the activity uh, for which the financial transaction is occurring. Um, that reminds me a little of the proposals that are in the Common Consolidated Corporate Tax Base proposal that the EU have in terms of saying if something 
if profits are made in France, even though they're realized in Ireland, their the profit tax is payable in France. Well, it could be a similar sort of concept. It'd be difficult to do, but it'd be a similar concept. It might be possible for an FTT. Uh, having said that, it took the European Union about 12 years to discuss that and figure out what they were going to do, so that might delay the, the introduction. Um, will there be losses of activity? Yes. Um, or fin of financial trading and activity? Yes. That would be likely. Um, but you'd have thought that would be targeted on the short-term volatile trades. And in a sense, those are, of some lim are really of limited benefit to uh, the welfare of society overall. Uh, in fact, it might be welfare enhancing, depending on how you, you look at the desirability or not of short-term um, volatile trades. And there'd be a job in GDP cost as well for financial, uh, for, for areas with large financial industries. Uh, in, in European terms, London would be the, the big uh, hit there. There'd probably be some impacts in Dublin, you would expect as well. Um, but those sort of job and GDP costs need to be traded off against the potential revenue source, which is substantial. Um, and government's job is to take these things in the round rather than in, on the on the, the minute. Uh, and I would have thought in the round, the positives outweigh uh, the negatives. Um, and overall, I, I suspect uh, that its time has come uh, for for uh, some type of a Tobin tax uh, to appear. You may feel otherwise. Let's let's see later. Um, I wanted to to quickly mention then the other side, and I'll, I'll do it quite quickly on the uh, indigenous sources for uh, development finance uh, as well. It, it, it can't all be about uh, the international world funding uh, development, as, as was referencing uh, in the output from that Doha conference earlier. Um, and that throws up a bit of a challenge for the uh, developing community in that there's a job to encourage and to facilitate indigenous sources of revenue via some form of domestic taxation system, um, which if established, would provide a stream of sustainable revenue for a government uh, and for government projects and for a country's development. Um, there's clearly issues about getting that far and, and doing such a thing. Um, uh, the governments themselves might not necessarily be democratic enough, if I can call it that way, for us to be encouraging to them to start collecting more tax revenue and we'd be assuming that they will properly use it in terms of advancing a country. And that wouldn't apply in all places yet, so that's a problem. Um, there are governance issues too in terms of collecting, managing and using uh, tax revenue, in a sense investments in revenue systems uh, that uh, and revenue collecting systems which need to occur. Um, if you were to bring in some form of local taxation in developing countries, um, and if you were to have some type of broad base for that, um, well, that implies probably making some of those who are, re or are already poor poorer. Uh, if you uh, impose a, uh, a VAT on uh, goods in, in a developing country, uh, well, in effect, that's reducing the buying power of um, uh, families uh, and poor families, and that has impacts uh, that we need at least to be uh, aware of. Um, but you're probably overall weighing up the the short and long term um, interests here, short term costs in terms of maybe making the poor slightly poorer, but the long term costs in terms of building a sustainable revenue source which allows a, a country uh, to uh, to develop and to to fend for itself. Um, there's interesting case studies out there, and I just want to, to refer to them rather than go anywhere with them. Um, in terms of the, you know, take, if you pardon me phrasing it like this, but you know, take some of the weakest countries in the world, almost some of the basket case countries in the world, countries like Rwanda and Sierra Leone, where um, VAT systems have been rolled out uh, in, in recent years. Um, consistently at the bottom of the United Nations Development Index, I didn't look this week to see, but I assume they're still right down in the, the cluster of countries at the bottom. Um, still, uh, you know, with very, very high levels of poverty, but in both cases introducing um, VAT systems in their country and generating revenue uh, for the Exchequer. And I know the Irish Revenue Commissioners were involved with the, the Rwandan authorities in, uh, in setting them up. Actually, it's worth visiting the Rwandan revenue website. It should remind you a lot of the Irish revenue website. <laughs> no, it's not the same, but I noticed the similarities. I was looking, uh, which was interesting. 
Um, Namibia also points out a also had a, a, a VAT or GST points out a, a similar a, a difficult challenge here in that it found during the food price increases that it had to cut that uh, to try and reduce the cost of it, it was applied on food to reduce the cost of food uh, for its population um, and therein lies some very difficult challenges when you suddenly start having to do that and you're eroding away the tax base but you're doing it to uh, address the the problems uh, in terms of people's ability to buy food uh, during uh, that uh, uh, ongoing, as it were, food price increases. Uh, I notice the Rwandans have an annual taxpayers' day, which they celebrate. I can't imagine we're ever going to go there here, but uh, they, they celebrate it and, and highlight paying tax as a, a national obligation. It was something you do uh, as a, a Rwandan. Um, change. Perhaps the Greeks need to follow this example, I don't know. But, but uh, following that... Uh, are you know making tax uh, understood and acceptable uh, in society and helping them to to stabilize and, and establish their base? Um, I saw some reference somewhere for um, awards for the best taxpayer and things like that that the Rwandan authorities uh, give uh, give out. Um, so to so pull that all and pull that all together with with uh, a few uh, conclusions uh, at the end. Um, Clearly, international and indigenous sources of development finance are necessary in the, in the longer term. Um, it would seem to me the international ones will always be a mixture of exchequer funding, uh, of funding from NGOs and from some, and I would have thought now, some form of uh, Tobin-like tax. Uh, there's a question as to what that mix is. And there's also a question as to whether if the Tobin tax were, or the financial transactions tax were to provide a certain sum of money, will that be substituted by governments taking away uh, some of the funding they give elsewhere to via the exchequer formally or uh, indirectly via the NGO sector? Um, and then clearly there's the uh, indigenous challenge of building sustainable national taxation system. Um, and that also highlights some type of role for a fairer trade system, particularly linking to transfer prices, which um, dovetails with the, the taxation system in a certain way. And I know that's where Sorley uh, is going to go with some of the Christian aid work uh, that he'll highlight uh, later on. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Sorley McCahy. I work with Christian Aid, um, a development organization. We work in about 50 countries around the world. We work through partners. Um, we're not an evangelizing, proselytizing organization. Um, we work with people of all faiths and none. I find it always important to get that out there nice and early. Um, Thank you to Tidy and to Sarah for inviting me to speak. Also, I just want to come at, uh, compliment Michal on his very cogent and clear presentation. And it makes my presentation seem quite scrappy and all over the place. So uh, thank you for that, Michal. But in, in my defense, I wanted just to mention that part of my presentation, I'm going to highlight the general arguments uh, around taxation as a development issue, what the challenges are for developing countries to generate revenue, um, the revenue in most cases to which they're entitled to, but which they don't always have the capacity or for other reasons don't always claim. But um, I also want to look then at some of the issues and place it in the context of DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and uh, the mining industry there. Now, 
Christian Aid has a new report coming out and it's been coming out for some time but at the moment it's with lawyers to make sure that it's not going to land us in uh, bankrupt bankruptcy because it makes quite um, what might be perceived as being quite strong accusations about the activities of one particular uh, mining organization, mining company operating in, in Dem Democratic Republic of Congo. So at the last minute I was told that this wasn't uh, cleared by lawyers so I've had to try to backtrack but I think I've managed to take some of the arguments that are still relevant to highlight the issues that are involved without um, without giving the name of the, the organization away. So if, uh, as Michal has said, I mean, um, there's an awful lot of, has been said already about financing for development and the, the money that may uh, be required to achieve, for example, the Millennium Development Goals. It's hard to put a figure on it, but uh, I don't want to spend too much time on that. I do want to just look at taxation as a development issue. It is probably the most obvious form of domestic resource mobilization. Though it's traditionally a neglected area, it's seen as the domain of tax specialists, uh, a technical issue. Bowden says it's um, its practical application is controlled by professional bodies, be they accounting or law. It may suit the profession to keep tax safely within its technical box, a convenient lie to keep prying eyes from closely examining the hidden power plays at work. And you can take that or not. But uh, the financial crisis, one of the things that it has brought into focus has been financial flows and illicit flows, and particularly taxation. Um, the G20 summit in London, uh, I remember Gordon Brown saying that the end of the age of the tax haven is over. Uh, it hasn't quite panned out like that, but certainly the issue of tax havens and illicit tax or capital flight was very much on the international agenda. Um, emerging from that summit, the OECD were tasked with exploring further the links between taxation and development, and that work is ongoing. The issue was picked up again in Seoul in 2010, and as part of its multi-year action plan, included support to the development of more effective taxation systems. Uh, the European Commission uh, published a communique in June of last year, highlighting the links between taxation and development. That involved two uh, directorates, tax and development, coming together, I think maybe for the first time, to look at the issues of tax and development. From that emerged legislative proposals that were released just in October, and I can refer to them briefly in a little while. But um, And then at, at a more popular level, I mean, we've had um, Madame Betancourt, the L'Oreal heiress, talking about how she would be happy to pay for more, uh, pay more tax um, for the national good. Um, Warren Buffett in the States describing how he happens to pay less tax than his secretary. Uh, Uncut in the UK have um, focused their um, activities and their campaigning on big multinationals who they perceive to be avoiding tax that should be paid, they believe, in, in, in Britain. All of this has had the effect of bringing tax more mainstream and shaped the discussion in some respects into one of tax justice and fairness in where and how much tax people and companies pay. So all very positive as far as we're concerned. For development organizations, tax has the potential to move states away from it in reliance on aid, to something much more sustainable, as Michal was saying, and predictable. Um, Aid, aid flows, as we know, are volatile and vulnerable to political factors. Importantly, though, it also shifts the accountability from donors to the population. A social contract between state and citizen is created when there is an effective taxation system in place. That negotiated contract between citizen and state is an important part of, of developing good governance. In many ways, he who pays the piper calls the tune, you could say. There is, of course, an incentive for government to promote economic activity. And in some cases, uh, there is or there is plenty of uh, academic research to show that where taxation systems are strong, countries show higher levels of governance indicators. There's also the obvious potential for uh, addressing inequality through the redistribution of, of wealth. 
That leaves aside, of course, um, the very obvious revenue benefit from increased revenue take, or increased taxation or effective taxation. Christian Aid estimates that just two forms of, trans, of uh, tax dodging, um, transfer mispricing and false invoicing, deprive the poorest countries in the world of $160 billion every year. That's far in excess of what's required to meet the Millennium Development Goals and far more than is received currently in aid. Uh, the OECD, who would be probably perceived as being quite a conservative body, agree at least that more, tax, more money is lost tax dodging than is received in aid. So while you might have issues with the figure of 160 billion or other figures, I think we can all safely agree that more money is lost to tax dodging than is received in aid. Um, just a, a quote from Hillary Clinton, who only recently really began to get the argument, I think, about taxation and, and development and talking about a, a igniting a virtuous cycle where taxpayers see that when they're getting value for money and that they can no longer rely on the old excuse for not paying their share. Higher revenues means that the government could provide better services and pay decent wages to public employees. And these reforms, in turn, create more attractive climate for foreign investors. And they strengthen the case that we can make to our own citizens, US citizens, for continuing to support development programs. And that's just a quote from an influential person on the issue of tax. But yes, I mean, to look at some of the obstacles to tax collection, and there are many, and these are just some of them. Um, in low-income countries in, in Africa collect about approximately between 11 and 15% of GDP and income tax, compared to about 35% in OECD countries, and that's for various reasons. Um, the informal sector in a, lot, in a lot of these countries is, is huge, and many people are not part of the, the, the formal sector and therefore aren't paying any kind of tax at all. And there are plenty of disincentives for people to join that formal sector. Um, it's hard to put a figure on how just exactly how big the informal sector is, but there are estimates of about 26%, for example, in Ghana, or 40% in, in, in Brazil. That's huge. And all in and, and all of those cases, nobody's paying tax. Apart perhaps from uh, certainly not income tax. Um, there are attitudinal and perceptional difficulties with for people with paying tax. There's a perception that tax burden is unfairly carried or unduly carried by poor people. Rich can, can avoid paying tax. The legacy of colonialism. Um, when at one point it might have been patriotic to find ways to evade and avoid paying tax in countries come independence, doesn't really make sense not to pay your tax anymore, but sometimes political realities uh, change faster than long-held prejudices. Tax compliance is often seen as onerous, as complex to taxpayers, especially in countries with low literacy levels, educational disadvantages, or as in the case, for example, of Mozambique, within countries where there's an awful lot of different languages spoken. Um, and then moving on to perhaps the big ones, or the low capacity of revenue authorities and oversight bodies, such as the parliament or audit institutions in country. Corruption between taxpayers and, and foreign companies and the revenue authorities. Um, and then the global financial regulation system doesn't do enough to curb tax avoidance. Looking at that particular one, the lack of transparency in the global financial regulation system, including the disclosure and reporting requirements of multinationals, as well as the extensive use of tax havens, makes it easy for some unscrupulous multinationals to pay little or no tax in developing countries. And then there's the use of tax havens. Uh, the African Union estimate that, that should be a dollar sign, 150 billion every year fl uh, flows out of Africa, and 80% of that money is going to tax havens offshore or indeed onshore in the case perhaps of Switzerland. Greater transparency is required. Interjurisdictionally, which is essentially greater exchange of information between countries given on an automatic basis. An intra-company, greater transparency in the reporting of multinationals, including the profits made and taxes paid, sales, 
um, at sales and assets held and other criteria in each of the jurisdictions in which they operate. They're the two key asks that civil society and what's broader than civil society at this stage are pursuing with some degree of success. But I want to place that in the context now of, of uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, if we look, in 2010, there was two high-profile cases involving international companies. They, they involved disputes over millions of dollars worth of, of, um, of, uh, not, of mineral resources that came from the DRC. But the interesting thing that th these disputes took place not in the DRC or in Toronto or London, where these companies were listed, but in tax havens. FG Hemisphere's Vulture Fund, fund uh, case against Grupo Monditerie de Lubumbashi took place in Jersey, and the Canadian firm First Quantum and ENRC took place in British Virgin Islands. It's not, I suppose, actually that unusual. And I've listed some of the mining companies operating in the DRC who have part of their company structure based in tax havens. And you can see them there. It is perhaps the norm to have company structures with presence in tax havens. So um, tr tax havens, um, of course, they, they do offer a certain degree of certainty for investments and they have a long held history of strong, being strong financial sectors. But perhaps the most attractive thing for investors is the financial secrecy that they, they offer and the possibility of profit shifting within a group of companies so that costs are allocated to high cost, high tax uh, jurisdictions. The impact of company structures such as this is that it is hard to assess how much profit the group is making from a particular project. If we look at the available data on mining and, and DRC, it's remarkably low. The profit is remarkably low in the in, in that is being paid by these uh, or, uh, companies. It suggests profits are being shifted offshore on a large scale and there are well-established methods for doing this if companies wish to engage in this and I'm going to look at, at one of these in, in more detail. Just a quick word about Congo. Um, it's well known for its uh, wealth of min natural mineral resources, diamonds, coal and tin, oil, natural gas. Um, it possesses 34% of the world's cobalt and 10% of the world's copper reserves. Um, and the potential that these, that these natural resources represent um, are huge, but yet tax revenues in DRC are amongst the lowest in the world. It has, as we all know, weak governance structures. It has a history of conflict. Democracy, it's in its infancy. If we look at the mining investment that is happening in DRC, most of it comes in the form of joint ventures where you have international investors collaborating with a national or a state mining company, Jeca Mines or Sodomico, with uh, a minority holding in the investment. Using such structures and by keeping the profits low or shifting them offshore, these companies can avoid paying profit tax in D or C, but also avoid paying the minority shareholder of the state, the state minority shareholder, that they're entitled to as, as a minority shareholder. The lack of transparency around these transactions because of the use of, of, of um, tax havens and because of the lack of requirement to report on a country by country basis makes it impossible to conclusively determine whether profit shifting is taking place. However, there is one indicator on, on whether this may be happening is how much profit tax is being paid in the DRC and we can get that information through the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative. That's what the EITI is. And figures um, published by Congo's Ministry of Finance. You can, uh, and I've, you can see here that in 2008, there was that amount of tons of copper shift from Katanga province and that amount of tons of cobalt. And based on the average metal prices over 2008, you could have had 2.3 billions worth of copper 
and 3.4 billions worth of cobalt. But in, in 2008, the total um, tax paid, a profit tax paid, was less than 18 million. And in 2009, albeit during the, the financial crisis, a measly $1 million. People will point to weak mining contracts or absent legislation, poor compliance, corruption all at play. But the low profit figures, together with widespread use of tax havens, strongly suggest that offshoring of profits is occurring in the DRC. One mechanism that this is carried out by is uh, mispricing of international trade. The OECD arms length principle is supposed to govern intra-group sales, where a commodity is traded between a subsidiary of the same company, it's sold as if it were sold on, on a fair market price, or what's recognized as being a market price. However, companies can overprice or underprice these exports to shift money in and out of a country. If, you, if we have looked at uh, EU customs data and we can see how imports from the DRC are, are priced, and in this case we looked at cobalt imports from the EU over the last 10 years. What does it show us? It shows us that, well, for the start, DRC is the largest supplying country of cobalt to EU countries, well in advance of, of um, South Africa and Russia. It also is the at the lowest average price, at an average of under $5,000 a tonne, while Tanzania exported at an average of $20,000 per tonne, four times the amount. Here we have, um, actually if we just go back one, and look at um, individual. Oh, sorry, I'll go on. If we look at uh, individual um, transactions, there's in July of 2008, there was exports from. DRC to, to, to Finland, because most of these exports are going to Finland, at $6,000 per tonne, and the median price was 54000 per tonne, nine times the value. Most of these exports, as I say, have ended up in Finland, and the data shows that the declared prices of all Finland's imports of cobalt from DRC are significantly lower than the lowest 25% or the, the lower quartile price of EU imports of the same commodity. And this is just highlights or demonstrates that particular statistic. The blue circles being Finland's import price, the green one being the EU's median import price, and the red one being the lowest 25% import price. So it's ludicrously lower than, than the, uh, the average price. Of course, you can have cobalt products having different concentration and quality, but I think, nevertheless, the discrepancy between the median price and the price of imports from the DRC clearly suggests that, the, at the very least, questions need to be asked about the nature of these transactions. Even at these possibly undervalued, underpriced values, these cobalt imports have declared value of over four billion over the last 10 years. Even if it's mispriced, but even a small margin, therefore, the loss to Jekyll Mines, the, the state mining company, could be enormous. So, um, what's, what's required? Well, uh, greater transparency would be the main thing. It's essentially a question of transparency, seeing what multinationals are doing, asking them to be, be more transparent in their operations, insisting that they be more transparent about the profits that they're making in each country, about the taxes that they're paying. In the specific case of Congo, the World Bank is doing a huge amount of work in the mining sector, 
But the World Bank should offer to support the DRC to audit some of the larging mining companies to see if an arm's length price is actually being implemented or if other tricks such as thin capitalizations are, thin capitalization is being employed. At the very least, these kind of audits would send a message to companies considering this kind of abuse. The next thing is there's clearly a need for greater capacity with regard to evaluating and monitoring the activities of companies operating in the region. And then to come back to country by country reporting, this would make clear where companies are incorporated, where they are declaring profits and paying taxes. It would also provide a risk management tool for civil society and, governance and governments to then investigate companies further. Similarly, a public register of beneficial ownership would show who the true owners of companies actually are. And finally, a requirement that the parties conducting a sale of goods, sales of goods or services in a cross-border transaction sign a statement in the commercial invoice certifying that no trade mis mispricing in an attempt to avoid duties or taxes has taken place and that the transaction is priced using the OECD arm's length principle. The World Bank in 2008 um, reckoned that the mining sector in DRC could contribute 20 to 25 percent of GDP and one third of total tax receipts in the next 10 years. But without this greater transparency that we're talking about, and without the capacity and the information to challenge this kind of abuse, that is almost impossible to address. It also requires greater political will. The damaging effects of tax havens are well documented, but there's little said about their positive effects. I mean, when has financial secrecy ever contributed to enhanced democracy? Aid remains the easier option, perhaps, compared to tackling capital flow from Africa, but it has the potential to be a lot more important. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sorley. If that's a disorganized discussion, then God, don't ever attend one of my lectures. That was, that's extremely interesting from both of you. Thanks a lot. Um, we have about fifth, tw 20 minutes, is it, sir, for, uh, for questions and answers. So um, you can direct anything you wish, uh, uh, anything you'd like elucidated, or um, any questions or comments people would like to make. Yes. Uh, excuse me, just to kick things off, I have two questions. Um, is there um, a, any sort of general agreement or consensus in terms of collection of indigenous um, tax resources? What percentage of GNP uh, developing country governments, you know, should uh, should be aiming at, you know, taking account of constraints such as the size of the um, inform, inform, informal sector? And secondly, the question to would be directed more towards, so towards Sorley. Um, um, the UN Centre on Transnational Cooperation, I mean, what is the potential out really for controlling transnational corporations and getting the type of transparency that you were, that you were talking about? You know, kind of what work is being done on, on that in the, at the international level at, at the moment? I mean, I know, for example, say in the in the you know, in the in the area of diamonds, um, there has a lot of, of very good work being being done. But you know, transparency in extractive industries that's still at a very early stage, I think. D um, Michal, would you like to maybe answer the first part of that, if you have uh, any okay. sense of it? Uh, let me battle with my my voice and try. Um, tax percentage of GDP. Uh, what came to mind immediately was the, the figures for Mexico that, that tend to appear on the OECD figures. Um, uh, Mexico will always be towards the bottom of that list with uh, you know, somewhere around the, the mid to high 20% 20% of GDP uh, collected in tax. To put that in some context, uh, Ireland 
which is a low tax economy, would be around 30% of GDP. The European average would be around 35% of GDP or, or thereabouts. Um, um, I don't know enough about the Mexican economy to, to comment on the level of inform, informality in that, but I assume it's quite high uh, as well. So I would have thought the, the initial benchmark might be to be thinking about getting uh, tax revenue in those countries up to the sort of mid to high 20s. Then, as the administrative structure kicks in in those countries, it, it's possible to, you know, a, a revenue structure and a more formalization of that. Uh, well, then the, the informal economy begins to decrease somewhat, and then you would expect to see that go up over time. So, short term, mid to high 20s, longer term, we'd be moving towards. Uh, a range between let's call it 28 percent uh, and 35 percent which might be you know where countries will put themselves and that clearly would be a, a sort of internal political discussion as to where they want to end up um, if, if sorry i think mentioned figures that that most certainly a lot of the uh, sub-saharan african countries are down around 12 uh, to 15 percent so there's certainly potential for the building of indigenous uh, taxation systems and, and revenue to come from that. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Pauline. Um, there, there is an awful lot going on on this area. And an awful lot has happened just in the last three years on this issue. I think, as I, as I said, in part as a reaction to the financial crisis and more inward-looking focus on, on uh, generation of, of revenue and perhaps a less noble uh, motivation where people are looking for alternatives to aid or, or certainly <coughs> looking to bridge the gap in aid shortfalls. So that has put the, the focus very much on, on tax again. The uh, OECD, we've got the mandate from the G20 to run with this to look at issues around uh, tax and development and they have carried on they, rightly or wrongly, are the organization who are driving this agenda. Um, and there's an awful lot of work that's going on there, looking at issues of automatic information exchange, looking at issues of country-by-country -country reporting, looking at the role of, of uh, the private sector in this. Um, but in my, our own experience, and Christian Aid sits on, on, on one of those, or two of those um, committees that is looking at that, it's a very slow process at the OECD. And there's an awful lot of vested interests at the OECD, so perhaps that isn't where the most fruitful outcomes are going to come. The European Commission, for its part, has been quite progressive on it, and particularly in the European Parliament. And there's been an awful lot of statements coming from the European Parliament in support of, of uh, the tax justice agenda, which has been reflected to a degree in things that are happening at Commission level. And as I mentioned, there was a communique that came out of the uh, Commission in June of last year, and as part of that communique, there was a commitment to exploring further what kind of a cost analysis, cost-benefit analysis of country-by-country -country reporting. That, the results of that didn't come out as further recommendations, but came out as legislative proposals just two weeks ago. And the legislative proposals are focused almost, are focused exclusively on the mining sector, or the extractive sector, and forestry, two of the biggest offenders in, in this area. And they have, there are certain requirements for those sectors now to report in a more transparent way than, than hitherto. Now, we would be of the view that they go nowhere near far enough to providing the kind of information that's required for poor countries to, to, uh, to uh, process the information for it to be useful. But it is very much a step in the right direction and shows that there is a degree of political will uh, behind uh, this agenda. The G20's communique yesterday, or not yesterday, whenever it was last week, also made significant um, statements, largely unreported because of all the other stuff that was going on. But there was a uh, listing of the uncooperative jurisdictions by Sarkozy. There was the um, the fact that every G20 member has now signed up to this multilateral exchange of information uh, agreement, of which Ireland is also signed up to. 
Um, there was the call from the G G20 for multinational companies to be more compliant and transparent in their, with the, in their dealings with poor countries. Um, and there's, there's lots of other things. Now, the G20, is, you know, it's, a, it's, it's a compromise and it's, it's a... You don't always very get very progressive statements coming from them, but the very fact that they have included this in the community is a very positive thing. From the United States perspective, the Dodd-Frank Act of last summer required that all extractive companies and and uh, all extractive companies who are listed on the SEC, the Securities Exchange Committee, need to report on a profit on a country by country basis as well. These are all positives that are um, suggesting that this is um, this is a campaign that has legs and that um, has the potential to offer developing countries the kind of returns on, on um, the investments of multinationals in their countries that, um, that, they're, that they deserve. I think that's just about covered. Thanks. Yeah, thank you guys for the really informative both of your presentations. Also have two questions. Uh, one, um, about the European Commission, you know, introducing this financial transaction tax, there was two things that sort of surprised me. One, definitely, that was there was no mentioning of using that money for any sort of development. Um, and you mentioned it briefly earlier. There was no mention of tax and currency transaction, any foreign exchange transaction, which is, you know, traditionally I think that's what Tobin was sort of aiming for. And you made the comment earlier, if I understood you correctly, that that's a rather small part part of the transaction. Um, and I'd like I'd love to hear more where you get that info. I believe I've seen graphs where the foreign exchange was actually quite substantial. And there was estimates that if if that would be globally implemented, I mean there's crazy numbers like ten trillion or something like that per year that could come in. So quite, you know, quite the difference um, on that. So I guess, you know, what do you think what about the currency and what about the development? And the other question is actually um, about the tax issue. You know, it seems like, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, there is a lot of potential for taxing resource export. And so my understanding is that currently the European Union is negotiating trade agreements, uh, the EPAs, the Economic Partnership Agreements, um, which I guess for uh, a large part of 2000, um, these least developing countries had waivers. So usually under the World Trade Organization, free trade, everybody's supposed to have like no tariffs, therefore no taxes on exports. Now this waiver expired, I think in 2008, um, and now the European Union says, well, my understanding is what they say, well, we have to um, you know, comply with the World Trade Organization, you guys have to drop your taxes on exports, which to me seems a large potential for these least developing countries to get taxes, if you could comment. Um, okay, yeah. let me kick off. <coughs> um, yes, the, the European Commission's proposal was explicitly to raise money for the EU, um, and uh, was, I think, presented uh, as a, a way of we've had to deal with this banking crisis and rescue all of these banks and whatever, and now we're going to get our money back. Um, uh, and I think what might have pushed the commission towards it was that it saw it as a potential source of revenue for running the commission um, um, in the longer term. Uh, so certainly development did not get mentioned there at all. Um, and I would have thought that will be a growing trend uh, that, uh, as, as we go along, the development community needs to keep its eye on that uh, pot. Um, in fairness, it's a very big pot of, of uh, funds, and there's no reason why it couldn't go to multiple uses rather than just uh, one, uh, one use. But certainly the European Union mentioned nothing. Um, the discussions in the United States, what there, what there have been in Congress recently, similarly has been entirely about um, providing revenue for, for the federal government uh, not in, and, and, and uh, recouping some of the banking costs and not at all for, for development uh, either. Uh, and given where governments find themselves now and given the fact that 
uh, there would be you know, a need to debt finance, to, to financing debt or servicing <coughs> debt in, in the years to come, uh, that um, um, most governments will have to you know, face higher bills, and there is an attraction of finding a, a new, somewhat inoffensive source of taxation revenue, uh, and that might make governments move for this, but uh, there is a cost there in, in a development context, or indeed if this was an environmental group in an environmental context, or whatever other groups that are, are keeping their eye on this pot of money, um, and, and perhaps the, the case for it needs to be asserted stronger, uh, you know, that there is, there's a use for it there. Frank made a point that I wanted to, I meant to make on the way through, which is that given that these are international transactions, it is very hard to pinpoint precisely where the home of the funds are, uh, and the fact that therefore they are sort of out there as part of the international community engaging uh, or trading uh, or moving things around uh, does strengthen the case for saying, well, then this might be used in an international context rather than to just uh, buttress exchequer <laughs> figures or exchequer situations. Um, on the uh, the currency a question on how big currency is uh, as a percentage, uh, I'll hold my hands up quite simply and say, I don't know uh, what the answer is. Uh, here's where I'd love to have my computer and try and Google that quickly or whatever just to see. Um, the, the reason I said it, it wouldn't be, you know, if you go back to where Tobin was, probably most of the transactions going on in the 70s, in the early 70s, and he made his proposal in what we see, as soon as he thought about it in the in late 60s and so on, uh, would have been currency. But through all the, the various financial instruments that have come along subsequently, there's a lot more other than currency uh, going on. Um, so the, the role for currency decreased. It was noticeable that currency did not get mentioned at all. In the, in the European proposal. Uh, I, I, when, I, when I read that, I, I was thinking about it after that, I went back to see did I miss it in some way, but, but it was left out. Um, and, and, and I think, to be very honest, given that we're talking about very, very small uh, tax rates here, I don't really think its inclusion would be noticed, uh, or its exclusion would be noticed for that matter either, if, if you know what I mean. Yet it, it, it has it's another potential source for, for generating large revenue. It's a step away from the, the explicit Tobin proposal uh, to leave it out. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I, uh, on the whole issue of ethos, I must admit to not following ethos very closely. Um, I'm following tax apparently to the detriment of everything else. But um, I've been desperately trying to think of something clever to say in terms of addressing that. I don't think I've managed it. But I, I think what, what's important, um, if I can relate it to the issue of contracts between mining companies and, and, uh, and governments, there is a distinct power asymmetry between the two institutions, the country and, and, uh, and company. And that's very much a factor in how these, these contracts are negotiated almost invariably to the benefit of the, of the large multinational and at the expense of the of the country. This is replicated, I think, in the negotiations that we're seeing at, at WTO and in the ethos as well. So that, that is one thing. And then the other thing I would say is the issue around transparency. Um, the, the, the money that is taxed or the money that is claimed through, through um, the, the, the small amount of of export tax needs to be needs to be in the open and, and transparent, so that at least that gives civil society some ammunition to hold governments to account. But on the actual details of the ethos that are being negotiated, I, I can't say very much more than you seem to be asking. Um, well, I, I'd like to just comment briefly on that because it seems to me that even if you allow export taxes to be imposed, you still run into the same problem because the taxes would be imposed on the artificially low price at which these goods are being exported. So it might get you an extra bit of revenue, but it doesn't really correct the fundamental problem that uh, that Sorley's work has, has exposed. Um, just to, I know there's another question down there, but if I might ask something, a corollary to that. So according to your data, the likelihood is that these... Um, exports are being artificially under-invoiced as they go into Finland. So Finland must be raising a substantial amount of, uh, amount of profits tax there. 
in that it's similar to the Irish situation, as you might know, in that there's often suggestions that stuff coming into Ireland on through multinational companies are uh, under invoice so that an excessively large amount of profits can be booked in Ireland to make use of our low corporation tax regime here. So if these large profits are being booked in Finland, then um, do, does, does the, it, it relates to Pauline's question earlier on, does the OECD play any role in policing its transfer pricing rules? Or is it just that countries sign up to the transfer pricing rules and then nobody actually polices them? Um, there are, as you probably know, guidelines for for uh, transnational, multinational corporations in the OECD. Um, have just actually recently updated. But in terms of actually policing them, I'm not aware of, of, their, of them having a role in actually policing them. Yeah, yeah. So... Yeah, but what is interesting, I think, is that this is almost a uh, an an unanticipated consequence of the extract extractive industries tax initiative, because the logic of that initially was to allow developing country populations see how much profits tax was been levied and going to their government, so that then they could keep track of whether that actually went into the government coffers and was spent appropriately. Mm -hmm. I think that was the initial logic. But now you've been able to use it very advantageously to see, look, you know, these the amounts of profits actually been booked in these countries are, you know, incredibly low, mm -hmm. artificially low. So I think that's how you create a political <laughs> dynamic whereby change arises in the world economy because we now have this extra information that can be used by, you know, campaigning organisations like yourself. So I think that's a, that's quite an, you know, an, an a, a, a better position to be in than we were in before the extractive industries initiative, you know, was uh, was was implemented. Mm. Uh, there's a question, I think, down at the end. Yeah. Uh, 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 first of all, I want to commend you for the presentation that you've done. This is uh, excellent. But this was to solve, in particular, the uh, success of DRC. Uh, I just want to find out in terms of how much you've been gained with uh, the methods uh, through the peer review mechanisms, uh, African methods in terms of how much you've been able to invest among all the issues that you've raised. Mm -hmm. And because you raised the point that there is lack of, uh, I think, weak governance in, in DRC, and particularly there is lack of uh, democracy. And so most of the civil society might not know, and that's why there is lack of transparency, both from ends the corporate uh, companies as well as the government system, which is very weak, because people are able not to know what's going on in the ground. But in terms of uh, uh, peer review mechanisms within the NEPAS, uh, how much are you engaging them so that they're able to discuss this at, at, uh, at, at regional level in terms of the subject uh, region level? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a very important point because I think what we identified in, in uh, analyzing or uh, evaluating our own campaign was that this has up until the last year, been very much a northern-focused campaign. I mean, it's not, uh, it's not um, inherently wrong that, but just there was a lag between what we were talking about and doing here and an engagement with partners or regional bodies in, in the countries that we were talking about. Um, but, I mean, we've, we, we have moved to... Partly we've moved to address that, and partly there's been greater engagement um, of, of partners and of, of countries in uh, around the issue. NEPAD, I don't think, have been very involved in this. Um, the institution that has been involved in it much more effectively has been a, a body called ATAF, the African Tax Administrators Forum, which is um, tax uh, revenue practitioners and authorities around Africa sharing best practice, supporting revenue authorities around Africa. Um, and they are the ones that are clearly best placed to push this agenda. I mean, it's for them to get, in, get engaged with SADC, it's for them to get engaged with um, the other regional bodies in, in Africa to, to push this agenda. Now on that, um, perhaps the most encouraging thing that happened of late was the African organization of Supreme Audit Institutions, ATAF, and the Collaborative Budget Reform Initiative collaboratively placed 
stemming capital flight from corruption and transfer pricing at the top of their agenda for the next few years. I mean, but you're absolutely right to have pinpointed that as being the most important, or one of the most important uh, weaknesses or, or gaps in the campaign to date. But it is happening, but it's just happening at a, a little bit, maybe, with a bit of a lag from what's happening at this level. Okay, we've run out of time. Um, thank you very much for attending and for asking these questions, but a particular vote of thanks, of course, to Michal and Sorley. And a just a uh, quick thanks to Frank as well. Um, again, please do attend more of our events this week. We'd love to see you at some more of them. Um, also, just unusually, there is quite a lot of cheese and bread out there. If anybody would like to take any of that, uh, the Long Room Hub uh, gave us that from, from just an event that they had just before. So you're more than welcome to take it, otherwise it'll go to waste. So uh, <laughs> if you want to take it. Thank you. No wine, just cheese. Yeah, just yeah. cheese. <laughs> I mean, we know who the company is. It's not the most So, if you do want to know, I have a no, we haven't approached you before, indeed. And we don't think we will be. We were just asking that. I said, Adam, that was that one. Or how are you trying to release that? We will be there. I think you're very wrong. Don't you know what I'm doing? I'm doing it. 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 I'm doing it.
Grab it if you want to. Who runs the aisle? If it's it's the aisle, it's the aisle from the pole vault. Yeah, it's Thanks, Frank. That was yeah. Uh, yeah, that was great. Good job. Um, I'm just going to close all of this up. What did you make about yourself now? What's that? What did you think about yourself? Yeah, I know it was good. Yeah, it's it's always nice when you get enough questions to keep you going. You know, it's sometimes mm. it can be very kind of slow in coming. So it's an indication that people were. Yeah. Confused. No, I think. Yeah, I think so. I think it was a. I guess it's a, a sort of self-selecting, relatively interesting group, really, because yeah. the topic, topic is quite, quite yeah. specialised. Yeah. specialized. Yeah. Um, so thanks, Emil. That's great. Is that your laptop? Uh, no, it's oh, right. to the college. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to still figure it out. I'm not very good with Macs, so I should really switch my oh. technology. Are you going out for a bit of cheese? Yeah. <laughs> I'll come out to you in a second. I oh. sure do. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm going to close this down and then I'll come out.